Good noon, everybody, and you are very warmly welcome to this uh, end seminarium of our pro project uh, H2 Ecosystems for Ostrobotnia. My name is Ossi Koskinen today, and I'm functioning as your moderator. In this session, uh, we will first hear about the work package number three, where Kaisa Pentila is going to present the project. Then thereafter, we will proceed and take work package number two, where Tel Uwe is going to present uh, SME interviews that he has conducted. And then we take a more technical part, which is presented by Shiva Sharma. Then there will be a panel discussion as well. And before the panel discussion, we will have uh, from the industry, uh, Olli Takalammi from OX2 presenting their huge offshore um, uh, wind farm project and how hydrogen is related to this project. So I wish you all very warmly welcome to this occasion. And please, Kaisa, let's start with your presentation. This presentation summarizes the results of the Work Package 3 in the H2 Ecosystem Roadmap project and serves as a visual representation of why hydrogen is important for our region, what is needed for its development and how this development can be achieved. The aim with the roadmap is to present a future vision and contribute to a broadened understanding of the needs for preparing the region as a whole to be involved in developing the business opportunities of hydrogen as part of a CO2-neutral, sustainable future. Let us start with a short recap of why green hydrogen is significant for reaching climate neutrality goals. The goal of transitioning to a climate-neutral and sustainable society is a key driver for both public and private actors to collaborate on changing the current energy system. The fossil-based system must be replaced by a combination of different clean and renewable alternatives. Green hydrogen can have a significant role in enabling this transition, especially in the decarbonisation of otherwise hard to abate sectors, and as a link coupling together different industries. Thus, transitioning to a hydrogen economy means to replace the existing hydrogen markets that use grey fossil-based hydrogen with green and carbon neutral hydrogen alternatives and use them in new applications that are otherwise hard to decarbonize. Besides being at the forefront of fighting climate change, the hydrogen economy is seen as a pathway to support the energy self-sufficiency of regions. This has become an increasingly topical question, especially during the last year due to the international security and energy crisis. However, the green hydrogen economy is not and should not be considered as the only development alternative towards reaching energy self-sufficiency and climate neutrality goals. There are clear focus areas where green hydrogen can be considered the best alternative available and others that are not. This is well exemplified, for example, in the well-known Michael Liebrich's hydrogen ladder. The areas where hydrogen is perceived most attractive and competitive against other technological solutions include the decarbonization of chemical and process industry, such as fertilizer production or production of green steel, as well as power to X processes, where hydrogen is produced and then used as a raw material in the production of synthetic fuels, such as green methane, methanol and ammonia for decarbonizing transport industry. The European Union and many other nations have formed their own hydrogen strategies, which direct public innovation and infrastructure investments into developing the hydrogen sector. The aim is to support climate neutrality goals and at the same time support business opportunities and EU's economical growth. Also, Finland has included hydrogen as one part of its climate and energy strategy for 2035, where different measures are presented for enabling the development of the Finnish hydrogen sector. There is now strong political support for hydrogen, power to X and carbon capture initiatives. And up to 150 million euros of public funding is directed towards initiating different collaboration and demonstration projects related to these green technologies. With this background as a reference point, we have set out to ask the question, what is needed for a hydrogen economy to develop? And how can this development be achieved? 
In order to answer these questions and to understand what kind of opportunities and challenges a hydrogen economy could present the region, the insights gathered from the literature reviews, three different workshops and from individual interviews and discussions have been analyzed and summarized. We present our analysis in the form of a roadmap and a future vision of a green hydrogen economy in Ostrobotnia. When we look at where the development of the hydrogen economy is today, we need to understand that we are on the first steps of a new and emerging socio-technical environment. Transitioning from a fossil-based energy system to a system relying on clean and renewable energy sources is not only a technological challenge, but a great social challenge as well. Thus, the variety of issues that must be considered is both multifaceted and complex. Looking ahead towards the year 2030 and imagining a region where hydrogen has become an important pillar in the local economy and in the energy system, many changes and a huge developmental leap must have taken place. To get a more comprehensive picture of this development, we will describe the strengths and opportunities of the region, as well as describe what is needed for the best-case scenarios of a hydrogen economy in Ostrobotnia to be realized. The most important strength of the region is the high amount of renewable energy that can be produced. This gives the potential of the production costs of green hydrogen to be one of the lowest in the whole of Europe. Besides beneficial premises for energy production, the strong energy technology cluster in Vasa and chemical and process industry cluster in Kokkola, with both leading global companies, high-tech and digital solutions companies, as well as SME subcontractors, lays the ground for global export of system-level solutions. The leading companies in the region are already active in the emerging hydrogen technology markets, and there are opportunities for SMEs to follow suit. A strength of the region is also that the idea of competing as an ecosystem has been built up for a longer period of time, and there is a tradition of cross-sector collaboration. The system solutions that need to be built require development and demonstration of sector coupling solutions and finding industrial synergies. There are excellent opportunities in the region to combine hydrogen production with carbon capture from municipal waste burning, for example, and use excess heat in district heating, as well as find uses for waste streams, such as using oxygen in the emerging battery sector. For developing the hydrogen economy in the region as a whole, a strength is also the collaboration between a triple helix of actors in business, regional development, and within research and education institutions. Actors in these different organizations have proactively started building the local know-how related to hydrogen technologies, system solutions, and developing the ecosystem in general. There is an opportunity to develop the region into an internationally known center of excellence. In the best case scenario of 2025, the Ostrobotnian pilots that have been initiated have now been successfully realized and the production facilities of hydrogen are in full operation. There is a total of at least 250 megawatt hydrogen production capacity at three different locations in the region, and an initial local market of hydrogen has been created. On top of this, local small and medium-sized hydrogen storage and transmission projects have been initiated. In the best case scenario, there is also a good integration of the whole value chain and there are local companies who are handling both production, storage, as well as transmission of hydrogen within the ecosystem. The success of the pilot projects has secured continuing political support for green hydrogen, and the strategies for the region support the expansion of the hydrogen business. The local network of triple helix actors are actively engaged in developing the hydrogen sector together. This development has been made possible by a steep learning curve regarding technology, business models and ecosystem models. Investment decisions of the pioneering pilot and demonstration projects have been made timely and a broad base of local companies of all sizes have been able to participate in the pilot projects and test and develop their products and services. 
Also, local authorities have been involved in an early stage. Information is shared proactively, and this way permitting processes have gone smoothly. The key to all this is that knowledge sharing between different actors is facilitated by good structures. Moving on to the vision for the year 2030. Business cases are now commercially viable and the region of Ostrobotnia is a net exporter of both hydrogen, clean fuels and power to x technologies. The steel and fertilizers industries have transitioned to using green hydrogen in their processes and the local companies have built the capacity of meeting the needs of an up to 5 billion euros export market potential. Rules, standards and incentives have been put in place for using e-fuels both in the marine and heavy-duty transport sectors. And also the region's local transport sector has fully transferred to using green fuels. This development has been made possible through upscaling of the demonstration projects and building up the infrastructure for transferring hydrogen. Hydrogen is now transferred by pipeline, connecting to the big green steel producers in the north, and the ports are in full use to export synthetic fuels by vessels. Most significantly, the development leap has been made possible by a strong local network of players that are running the hydrogen business as an ecosystem and provide solutions both for local and international customers. Through mobilizing both public and private financial resources, the region's green electricity and green hydrogen production capacity is to a large extent locally managed and owned, which has contributed to making the hydrogen economy a significant pillar in the local economy and in reaching regional climate goals. Let's move on to summing up the key issues that need to be taken into consideration that impact the development of this vision. Many of the system level solutions that are visioned as part of the emerging hydrogen economy are now developed for the first time. For these to be realized, different technologies in the hydrogen value chain need to become connected. At the moment, very few actors have a detailed system level understanding of how all the different technologies will be combined. This means that building these solutions will require modeling and experimenting with possible alternatives. Knowledge will thus need to be built up gradually, interactively with different stakeholders in the process. And this takes time. The pilot and demonstration projects that have already been started in our region are good examples of all the required system level alignment that needs to take place in order for green hydrogen solutions and their business cases to be realized. Besides business partners, also the broader network of actors must be involved in learning process. These include the local research and education institutions who will educate the required workers in the future, but also local decision makers and authorities who will make decisions regarding land use plans and be in charge of permitting and safety standards. It is through building up knowledge within the larger Triple Helix network of actors that the region as a whole will be able to develop and benefit from the hydrogen economy. The key message is that these local pilot and demonstration projects are vital for directing the development of the hydrogen economy in our region. It is through these projects that a deeper understanding of the system level operation and the business feasibility is developed. This knowledge is built up interactively with initial customers, business partners and suppliers of different components. It is also through the pilot projects that the ecosystem of partnerships is built up who can together develop the system level solutions for global export. Based on the vision and the key implications for how the development can be achieved, a summary of recommendations for next steps and action points for the future is now presented. First of all, local decision makers should put focus on determining the role of hydrogen in municipal and regional strategies and include it as one piece in the puzzle towards climate neutrality. 
the strategic focus should be combined with directing public funding accordingly. Second, business leaders in the pioneering projects are encouraged to be transparent and involve local stakeholders, suppliers, researchers and public authorities in the development so that knowledge can accumulate in the region among a broad base of actors. Third, there are specific knowledge needs that research and education institutions in the region should respond to. Building a demonstration environment where hydrogen as part of the larger energy system can be studied is one of the areas that should be prioritized. Other important areas include the business models related to the hydrogen economy and developing knowledge and hydrogen safety and standards. Overlapping activities should be avoided and instead actors are encouraged to reserve adequate resources for collaboration and joining forces across organization boundaries. Fourth, an actor that coordinates the hydrogen development activities in the region and a structure that continuously supports these activities should be defined. We suggest that regional development companies establish a Hydrogen Ostrobotnia team that can coordinate activities in the region. This new organization should have a clear goal to do matchmaking between different actors so that concrete pilot and demonstration projects related to hydrogen are started. To conclude, the region of Ostrobotnia has all the possibilities to develop the future hydrogen economy. This will, however, require visionary leadership and orchestration, and that all needed actors find their own role in the emerging ecosystems. Different actors across sectors will need to collaborate together, both business, public authorities and research and education institutions. Considering the historical development of the ecosystem in our region, we have every chance of reaching this goal. But the journey has just begun, so let's continue and accelerate this important work together. We wish to thank our project collaborators and financiers, as well as all of the over 150 individuals who have in some way participated in our activities. Thank you. Thank you, Kaisa. What a great video recording you have done. And one objective of our project is to disseminate information. And that is the main reason that we wanted to do a video recording. And I, it was first time for me to see this video. And, and, and I was really amazed and pleased with the content. Uh, we are actually living at the moment the fourth wave of hydrogen coming at the moment. And quite often uh, I'm asked the question that when will it be the true breakthrough of hydrogen economy? Uh, some specialists stated that it will be 2030, and in last spring somebody was starting to say that it will take first place in 2040. But my answer to this question at the current moment is that we have the hydrogen economy, economy right here now today, because there's a huge need for hydrogen in different kind of industrial settings, exactly like Kaisa mentioned in her presentation, presenting this hydrogen ladder which we very strongly believe here in Ostrobotnia. So uh, the main question is not how to create maybe new consumption for hydrogen, but how to replace the gray uh, fossil fuel uh, produced hydrogen with the green hydrogen here in the, the Ostrobotnia. And we can take advantage of the new wind uh, establishment, but also solar establishment in our region. Now we'll move forward and take the next presenter, Chel Uwe Alskuk, and he has uh, been uh, interviewing SMEs here in, in the Ostrobotnian region and the business opportunities that hydrogen is providing for them. Chel Uwe, please go ahead. Thank you. Can you confirm also that you see my screen and then you hear yes. me? Good. So, good afternoon, everybody, and, and um, yeah. As I said, I'm Chen Uwe Alskog, uh, manager of, of the consulting company Alsea, and, and um, I've been involved in this in this project, working on 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 the on the the SME side, and and trying to analyze what this vision that that Kaiser was presenting here, what would that mean for for our 
our local, our regional companies, and and uh, what in particular what what would be needed from their side, and 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 what can be done to enhance this to enhance this development. So the target group for me is 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 the regional regional companies, and 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 uh, and to see then what how we can how how we can enhance and and support them in 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 this development. Um, Kaisa mentioned the local projects, and I, I definitely believe that they, the projects will have a, an, an important role to play. I think it's what well, the interviews I've made shows that it's it's quite unrealistic that that uh, local and regional companies could, especially the small ones, could go from from being operating on the local market and then suddenly suddenly reach reach um, the, the the international global glo global players. Uh, so the, the project will will have an important role to play here, so that that they can 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 test their their products and their services, uh, and and uh, get references that can be used further on, uh, get the proof of concept, and also develop their own con competence and ensure that they have all the the licenses etc. in place, that all the operational standards are there, so that they can then. Then can then then expand and 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 uh, reach reach further out on the on the, on on the market for those for whom this is is realistic. Of course, as you can see later on in my presentation, all business opportunities will not be directly uh, heading for a global market, but but there are certainly certainly such opportunities. Here. Uh, and and. One conclusion is, as in most businesses, that the more specialized products and services that the company can offer, then then the bigger is the potential to to reach reach customers outside your own region and and, and further on to the to the global global market. Then Kaisa, Kaisa already showed you a map of, of of some of the projects that are that are being planned um, or vision vision here for for the region. Um, as as you can see, they are they are of different sizes, and and what I think is interesting here is that that if we look look back a few years, then for instance, uh, um, 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 uh, electrolyzer of, of thirty megawatt, like the one that is planned here in in, in West Energy, for instance, that would have been been uh, really the, the on the top. Top level on on a global scale, and and now we see that that companies are planning for much much bigger, bigger production units like the one in Kristinestad, and and we will hear later on today about about uh, the offshore project in in here in in Kvark and the line line one, which is even bigger. So we're talking about really really big. Some of these are really 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 big, big ones, and and what I also think is interesting is that that. Uh, the majority of these ones are not only uh, aiming at producing hydrogen, but but also further processing this into into uh, other other so-called e-fuels through this uh, what is called the power to X process. And in in our region, it's particularly e-methane that's in that's in is is in in, in question. So. Uh, just a few words about about what what is this power to X before we go on. Uh, then then power to X actually is is you can say that it's three different processes that are that are combined into one. Not necessarily always at the same site, but it seems like most most projects aim at, at doing this this at the same site. Uh, so it's the it's the electrolyzer where we produce the the, the hydrogen. Using using renewable energy uh, and water as, as the resources, and then further processing this uh, into into um, uh, the so-called e-fuels using then either uh, captured uh, carbon dioxide through the so-called uh, carbon capture and utilization process, and then mixed mixed with the hydrogen uh, to to produce uh, e-methane or or uh, methanol. Uh, another e-fuel that is is, is 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 also in the pipeline is is ammonia, uh, where you don't use 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 carbon dioxide but but nitrogen, but also captured captured from from uh, through more or less the similar similar process. 
So um, I think this is interesting to keep in mind that we're not just talking about the electrolysis as, as such. It's a much broader concept, uh, which of course also means means uh, more opportunities for for our regional companies to to get involved. We should also keep in mind that that we're not only talking about the process itself. There's a lot of of business opportunities upstream here, as you can see later in my presentation, that, that for for producing these these all the equipment and all the, the all the the everything that is is used in the installations and and of course the construction work themselves. So so it's what I want to point out is that that we should consider the whole value chain here when we talk about. Talk about the hydrogen business and the growing hydrogen business, not just the electrolysis and and and, and the, the, the actual production of, of hydrogen. Um, Kaisa mentioned uh, shortly why why we do this, why is why why not just produce the hydrogen? The re main reason for for this power to X process is is that you get you get a fuel that is easier to store. Uh, uh, pure hydrogen is is quite difficult to handle. The e fuels are are uh, quite quite much much easier to store, and usually there's also a ready infrastructure for for um, for for uh, distributing and 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 uh, and using them not only locally here but on the on the European European market. Um, another aspect that I think is important to point out when we talk about the whole potential with this with this new business is that that everything is not re related to to handling or 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 or, or dealing with the with with the hydrogen and and, and the e-fuels um, there's a lot of other business business opportunities here as well, here as well so with this this picture here taken from a from a methanol methanol site um, storage site then then of course, the pipes, the fittings, uh, the wells, and, and 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 measurement equipment, and so on used here, they of course have to to comply with 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 the safety and quality standards and and all that that applies to to such a fuel. But of course, we have a lot of other um, equipment around this that is also needed, like the like the the, the steel construction for for carrying all this. So. So, and that is, of course, of course, to some extent, it has to comply with with quality requirements and so on, but not those that are directly related to to the much more stricter hydrogen and 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 fuel fuel chemical requirements. So, so that is something that I think is important to keep in mind here as well. That 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 it's a quite broad broad range of of, of new businesses and existing businesses that 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 can grow, and and where I think are are regional companies or the interviews that I made show that our, our regional companies have should have had quite good good opportunities to, to involve. Um, what, what, what my interviews have shown is that that there's so many companies are not really aware of, of, of all this. They have not really considered what does this mean for us? Uh, where in the process could we fit in, et cetera, et cetera. And also the structure of these projects, uh, which is kind quite new to to our region, especially, is 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 often unclear. So they don't really know where they where they where they fit in and and, and what does what could this mean for us. So I try to illustrate illustrate the setup, uh, the basic setup with with this graph here. Uh, of course, all projects are are different. There is not one single truth of how these these large scale projects are are managed, but but anyway, this is this is a way of of of, of visualizing a little bit how it. What well, what are the basic basic setup and 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 main players, main actors? So if we short and just go through who does what, then we have the project owner. I mean the 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 the, the main main actor in 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 these in these projects. Uh, the one who is usually initiating it, having the main responsibility for the planning and the execution of the project, uh, also the one who then who choose the main partners to work with and so on. Uh, seldom the project owner is capable of financing everything themselves, uh, so they 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 have have in that either international investors or 
energy companies uh, that that come in and 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 partly or, or fully finance finance these projects. And of course, there's a lot of quite a lot of of, of um, possibilities to get get subsidized these projects nowadays because especially EU is is promoting promoting this this uh, development heavily right now, as we heard from Kaisa. If we then move on, uh, then we have the the VPC or VPCM contractor, uh, engineering, procurement, uh, construction management is what it stands for. This is kind of the the project owner's right hand. Uh, they work work close together, and and um, from project to project, then 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 the roles can vary uh, quite quite significantly, but. But in in principle, the 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 EPC contractor is is closely involved in the selection of of of, um, of, of the pro main process equipment suppliers and the main contractors. They do a lot of the feasibility studies, the environmental impact assessment, uh, heavily involved in the in the procurement process with the RFI and RFQ, uh, also with the permit applications and so on. Uh, Quite often, also use subcontractors to support them in this because because there's a lot of expertise needed in this. So so they have they have a big role and and uh, work work closely with the with the project owner in 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 in, in many of these these, these uh, different sub processes. Then um, if we move on, we have the what I call the main process equipment suppliers. I mean. The, elect the suppliers of the electrolyzers, the, the, the CCU equipment, and 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 um, the, the, all the all the equipment needed for the for the production of the methane or the methanol or the ammonia. Um, these are usually large players uh, working on a global market. Uh, not so easy for our, our 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 regional companies to to start to start com competing directly there. There is a few companies though in Finland that work with. With electrolyzers and also with 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 uh, CCU and and with methane production, so so on, and, and they are gaining market market share as well. But where I think that we our com regional companies have a bigger opportunity is then uh, in in the in the sub supply uh, segment here, uh, producing all these different different equipment equipment that is 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 needed. Need used and, and needed in 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 these, for instance, the electrolyzers and so on. Um, have to comply with strict technical requirements, both on the products and the processes. Uh, so it's 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 a segment that that put quite strict strict and tough requirements on 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 the on the manufacturers. But on the other hand, once you get a foot into this. This business, then, then there is, a, as I see it, quite a big potential to to, to also grow out on the on the, on the global market. Uh, and we already have uh, companies in the in the in the network around here here that 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 already are are part of these these supply chains producing, for instance, electricity components and so on that that. Um, that are used 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 in in uh, electrolyzers, for instance. So time is running. Let's move on. Um, the main contractor, um, and that's the the construction company that is then selected for 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 the for the construction of of, of, of the site, uh, having the overall responsibility of of of, of the, the the whole whole construction process, uh, and they in turn. I mean, they have they have their own own resources, but they also then hire subcontractors to 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 do a lot of the work, and and uh, of course they procure procure the equipment used used for for the construction and for the installations and so on. But not the main process equipment that is that is primarily done directly by the the project owner and the and, and PPC contractor. So here we of course have we have a few really large uh, construction companies. Operating in our region, and and they are of course strong candidates then to 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 get these kind of contracts. But then we have the whole um, chain of of subcontractors, starting from from uh, companies doing the, the the excavating works for the construction site, all the 
different installations, piping, tank, tanks, etc., electricity installations, safety and security, and of course also service and maintenance once the once the site is up and, and running. Uh, so, so the subcontractors here, are, that's that's where I think that, that, that we have big potentials for for the regional companies in the construction phase now of the, of the big big projects that we see. But of course, also once again, when when they have have, have been able to to work in these regional um, projects, then uh, they have their their uh, gained experience and and know how, and they have the. Uh, the network ready to also then maybe compete on on similar projects outside our, outside our regions. Then of course then we have we have a lot of, of um, equipment needed for 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 the on-site installations, starting from for instance the metal construction that I showed on the on the previous page to 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 uh, pipes, cables, fittings, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Much of this, where we have companies locally here that that are, are well capable to 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 produce such such equipment and and able to 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 compete. But of course, they have to they have to be aware of this and 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 uh, able and interested also to adapt their their equipment and, and and products so that they they meet the standards and 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 the needs of of these these types of of, of, of projects. Uh, further on, uh, then then uh, there is quite a lot of need for for different types of consultants uh, working working supporting, for instance, the EPC contractors, etc. Uh, we have uh, there will be a, a big need for for uh, local knowledge on, and in combination with technical and environmental and, and juridical expertise, etc. The IT sector is, of course, also an in, in, in important important segment here that that um, that, that uh, will have have big opportunities and possibilities with with all these new needs for for optimization and 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 so on. So what I want to say with this is that there are a lot of opportunities uh, for for our, our our local and regional companies, uh, but it's very much up to the companies themselves to understand uh, what's their role in the in in the chain, understand the process itself, uh, and be active, and and uh, work work actively to to contact contact the identify first of all the actors, and and then stay in in touch with them and 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 uh, market their their products and services etc. Of course, ensuring that you comply with all the relevant standards, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah. There will be, be further discussions later on today about about then how to move this forward, and I'm looking forward to hear what the what the the the, the participants in the in the panel discussion come up with. But I think that they will the, the business network and, and the regional development companies yeah, will, will have a big, One big role please. to play here. In the in the future for this development. So, with those words, I say thank you. Uh, my report will be possible to to download from from the project website, and you have my my contact details there if you have further questions and so on. So, thank you. Tell you very much for a very good presentation about that topic. And you mentioned quite many times power to X in your presentation. And this is maybe one outcome or also or result of our project that when we discuss hydrogen, it's a pretty, let's say, tricky uh, base element to store. So uh, many companies are very, very keen on to uh, 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 make out of the hydrogen some other uh, synthetic fuels like methane or, or methanol, or like they are going to do in Dantan, in Nordendal, uh, ammonia there. Good, thank you very much uh, for this presentation, Chelub, and let's move forward. The uh, third uh, package uh, was uh, about technical and uh, commercial issues, and Shiva Sharma is going to present that part next. And uh, let's see, <laughs> where is the camera? And uh, Shiva, please go ahead, and I assume that you will explain us briefly also what is the water electrolysis and how it will operate? Please go ahead, Shiva. Yes. 
Uh, hi everyone. First of all, I would like to thank you for, thank you all for being here at our final seminar. This project has truly provided us an opportunity to research on green hydrogen from different perspectives. I think we're all aware. Next slide, please. I think we're all aware that man-made climate change and greenhouse effect that is causing global warming. According to many experts, we need to stop global temperature from raising 1.5 degrees Celsius and in order to avoid the worst effect of climate change. To achieve this, uh, global greenhouse emissions need to uh, drop to zero and many countries have set to achieve this by 2050. Uh, next slide. Uh, it will take many different solutions to achieve this goal, but one tool that is gaining popularity is hydrogen and fuel cell. So what if I tell you right now, 95% of all hydrogen is produced from fossil fuel. And this is when the concept of green hydrogen comes in. Concept of green hydrogen was first mentioned by British scientist JBS Halden, next slide, in 1923. And only in 1990, that prediction came true when hydrogen was produced from solar energy in German plant, pilot plant. So what is green hydrogen? Well, there are many color codes for hydrogen production, such as green, blue, gray, etc. Uh, and definition of these codes are not universal and may differ from country to country how they define it. Based on European certified project, Hydrogen is considered green if it is generated by renewable energy and the process carbon emission of produced hydrogen are 60% less than that of gray hydrogen. And of course, gray hydrogen is made from fossil fuel. Hydrogen is, uh, best, blue hydrogen is basically gray hydrogen when, where produced carbon is either captured or stored or captured and utilized. Next slide. Uh, if we are really going to be carbon neutral by 2050, I think there is no choice but using, uh, using hydrogen. Renewable energy can only get us so far and it has its own problems such as wind not blowing always and sun not shining at night and winters. Hydrogen can help us to decarbonize range of sectors that has been hard to clean up in past, such as chemical, iron, steel, uh, and as well as uh, uh, transport sectors, especially the heavy and long transport sectors. Uh, next slide. So everything looks great, right? Uh, what is the catch? Why we are still struggling with, with it? So next one. So if if you're like me missing your chemistry lessons and have a bit of trouble remembering what is hydrogen, let's start with some basics. Uh, hydrogen is the most abundant element in universe and also the first element in periodic table. Hydrogen is very reactive and is found freely in uh, is not found freely in nature and only exists in combination with other elements. So to produce hydrogen, you must extract hydrogen from its naturally occurring compounds like methane or water, and it is very energy intensive process. Um, next slide. Green hydrogen can be produced through electrolysis of water. So what is electrolysis of water? Uh, it is a process uh, in which electricity is break down uh, in its water components, molecules, hydrogen and oxygen. There are mainly three different types of electrolysis technique used to produce hydrogen. Next slide. Uh, alkaline electrolysis. The principle of alkaline water electrolysis is simple. Oxygen and hydrogen are separated from water when direct current is applied. And the working temperature is generally maintained between 80 to 90 degrees Celsius. And uh, working pressure is maintained within 3.2 megapascal. Next slide. Uh, 
uh, PEM electrolysis, according to literature, PEM electrolysis can reach an efficiency of 80% at one uh, ampere per centimeter square uh, area, a value that is commonly practiced only at lab scale, but hard to find in uh, outside. When the voltage is applied, water is oxidized at the anode to make hydrogen ions, electrons, and oxygen. The hydrogen ions are then moved through the conductive polymer membrane to the cathode where they are reduced to form hydrogen gas. Next one. Uh, high temperature, a typical technology for high temperature electrolysis is solid oxide electrolysis cell. Uh, they are less mature technology that uses uh, solid ceramic materials. Uh, and, and one advantage of this uh, uh, system is that uh, they use heat as a substantial part of energy required than, uh, than more expensive uh, electrolyzed, uh, electricity. Next slide. Uh, once hydrogen is produced and processed, it needs to be distributed, stored safely. Uh, commercially viable hydrogen storage is regarded as one of the most technical challenging barriers uh, for widespread of uh, hydrogen. There are many different ways to store hydrogen, such as in high pressure cylinder up to 800 bars, liquid hydrogen in cryogenic tank, uh, tank at 21 Kelvin, uh, chemically bonded in covalent and ionic compounds, and through oxidation of reactive metals such as lithium, sodium, magnesium with uh, water. Next slide. Uh, now this, the most proven, tested and commercially viable storage is in compressed gaseous form or in liquid form. To achieve satisfying energy density with compressed gas storage system, the operating pressure has been raised up to 700 bars. Gaseous hydrogen is usually distributed to the point of use either in high pressure containers or by pipeline. Of course, uh, the cost of green hydrogen was a topic of interest not only for us but also to our steering group member. Next slide. <clears throat> the market price of next one. The market price of uh, hydrogen generally depends on required parameters such as its puricity. Uh, distribution, transport, and storage are important when green hydrogen is produced on large scale, and that also determines the final price of uh, uh, price for the customer. Currently, most of the hydrogen is produced on site by steam methane reforming method. When we talk about cost of hydrogen, uh, its production cost is mainly influenced by its uh, capital uh, expenditure, the operating expenses, lifetime, and efficiency uh, of the system. Uh, next slide. Next one. Uh, so how do you calculate the level? Uh, so, so how do you calculate it? Levelized cost of hydrogen uh, uh, is the method widely used to assess the cost of hydrogen. This method is based on a levelized cost of energy method that is that is used to uh, that is used in the renewable energy sector, where life cycle costing of renewable energy is presented in terms of cost energy output. Uh, levelized cost of uh, uh, hydrogen is measure of average total cost to build and operate a power plant over its lifetime divided by the total energy output of uh, uh, over output over the lifetime of the plant. So for levelized cost of hydrogen is going to be all cost to build and operate power plant over its lifetime divided by total hydrogen produced in kilo. And next slide. Uh, main cost for green hydrogen comes from capital cost, 
operation and maintenance cost and electricity cost. Uh, as you can see, electricity is the large part of the cost while producing green hydrogen. Next slide. Uh, something that might be interesting for you all is this table I have prepared. Uh, finding how much the investment cost does the hydrogen uh, fast hydrogen production facility cost where uh, uh, our interest and of course uh, interest of many of you uh, and it was also not very easy to find uh, this table i have created uh, by going through number of literature and and also talking with some of the companies next slide uh, and of course, if you are here, someone who knows more about this cost, uh, I'll be very glad to know. And 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 uh, if there is something not correct, please uh, uh, let me know. And next one. Uh, I try to create uh, different scenarios for hydrogen production. <clears throat> I will not go through everything here. Uh, uh, I, I we have already. In the, I will not go through them here, which is available in our report that is already published in our homepage. But one thing that is important to mention is that we often talk about using renewable wind, solar power, or even cheap or free electricity to produce green hydrogen. The finding was that yes, electricity costs were significant to uh, to operate uh, significant. Uh, but uh, so hydrogen production through standalone uh, standalone sites and and produced through cheap electricity were actually more expensive than than the uh, uh, the facility that is producing hydrogen all the time. Meaning that if a power plant can operate at its full capacity then the production cost for hydrogen per kilo was lower. Uh, <clears throat> in this table, you can see that the cost of hydrogen per kilo in different scenarios. Scenario one was uh, connected to the grid, so it had full capacity factor, so it was running uh, all the time and, and, and producing hydrogen most of the time, so that was the cheapest. In scenario two, it was connected to the uh, wind farm and the capacity factor was uh, 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 connected to the wind turbine. So every time wind turbine produce electricity, then only hydrogen was produced. So it was uh, uh, more expensive than to uh, grid connected. And of course, the last scenario was cartel energy meaning that if there is a free electricity in the grid, then we produce only uh, that time the hydrogen, and it was uh, one of the expensive one. Overall, efficiency, difficulty to store, and lack of infrastructures plays a big role in adaptation of this technology, and hopefully it will change in future. And, and uh, at this, uh, there were many assumptions in my report, but it will give you overall idea of uh, cost and how it is calculated. And also these figures were uh, figures for electricity cost where before you can crisis and hopefully it is temporary and we go back to normal. Next slide. Uh, uh, next one. So I hope my presentation give you some extra knowledge in production storage and as well as some cost of production and if you have questions please feel free to ask okay thank you very much shiva for an excellent presentation and uh you had the table there about the production costs and uh it was quite let's say almost strange phenomenon that we both came to the same conclusion although we were doing the studies <coughs> on on, on the, uh, say separate places that um it's very often referred that in the future we will have so much cheap electricity available that uh, it will enable uh, to produce very cheaply green hydrogen. And that is not quite the case. Like you presented, there are three different business models. And you say that the highest uh, uh, 
uh, hydrogen uh, price per kilogram was actually when we used this uh, so-called curtailed wind and solar energy. Uh, but how we can do it here in Ostrobotnia, we have a very good opportunity to utilize and, and take advantage of uh, PPAs, power purchase agreements, because we are having at the moment much wind power and even more wind power in the future. So uh, there are two key, when we discuss the figure that you presented there very well, levelized cost of hydrogen, there are two key components influencing this uh, figure. Uh, on the other hand, it's the uh, price of electricity and that we can gain cheap electricity from the wind farms, maybe 30, 35 euros per megawatt hour. And the second is the operation hour uh, of the electrolyzers. You mentioned very many times there the word capacity factor, which means actually how much are the full load hours of the electrolyzers. So uh, we cannot make any hydrogen business if the electrolyzer is standing still 80% uh, of the hours, 8,716 in, 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 in one year. So we have to keep the electrolyzer running at least maybe 60-70% out of the time and get cheap electricity. So thus we have all good circumstances to, uh, to have a good and uh, let's say very profitable uh, hydrogen economy here in Ostrobotnia in future because we have the very good wind conditions here on the coastal region. Uh, and then uh, just small tiny detail is that, like I said, you, sh you shouldn't either ignore uh, solar power and if you take a solar radiation map, you can see that there's a huge difference also here in Finland between the coastal region and when you go inland. So if we compare the solar radiation per square meter, so it's almost 10% more here in Vasa at near the shore than in Laihia, just because there's more sunshine closer to the uh, coastline. Okay, now I talked already about the sea and let's travel next to the sea and I hope that we will have uh, Olli, uh, let's see, I don't remember his name, Olli Takalahti, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah, Takalammi, sorry Olli. Yeah, ta yeah, Olli Takalammi from OX2 is going to present us the industrial view uh, to produce offshore hydrogen. And before Olli start, uh, I can try to market this topic because uh, during the process or during this project, there has been some up and downs and one up for me personally was when I was reading a research report from Danish Technical University uh, about offshore hydrogen, offshore wind and hydrogen production. And they were able to get very, very low 2.5 euros per kilogram the price of uh, offshore hydrogen when they were optimizing the right size of electrolyzers in this case. But good, let's go to the seas and Olli, are you here somewhere with a little bit Yes, there is Oli. Please, yes, Oli, go ahead. The state is I yours. Am here. So excellent. Thanks a lot for for having a chance uh, to present uh, Line Offshore Wind Park and and the, especially then uh, then I will tell tell about the hydrogen plants we have. So uh, we see uh, offshore wind wind first of all as a as a chance and opportunity that to create uh, such a fossil free energy hub uh, in the in the northern Europe. There is lots of uh, opportunities in this area and and the uh, and the sea Baltic Sea is a is a good place for for offshore wind. So first one slide about the company. So OX2 uh, we are we are over 300 employees uh, headquarter in, in, in Stockholm, but uh, the presence in Finland has been growing, growing and, and the importance also here and, and then Baltic Sea as our home sea is naturally then, then important also uh, for us. Uh, in Finland we are more than 70 employees already nowadays and, and lately we have established a office in, in Vasa as well to be closer to the to the offshore projects we have. Uh, so our business model is that we are we are developing uh, assets, meaning onshore, offshore and then solar, uh, solar PV farms. Uh, then then we are organizing the financing, selling the, the assets to be to be constructed. 
then we take care of the construction uh, as, a, as a turnkey and then very often we also then state uh, like a, taking care of the technical and, and commercial uh, operation uh, and the management of, of the of the wind farm uh, then throughout the whole life cycle so in in offshore we are talking about 25 to 30 years onshore it's it's already more than that 30 35 years and we have actually our roots come from the onshore wind that that uh, that we have done the most than anybody else uh, within Europe uh, during the past five six years uh, we are striving towards 100 sustainable and renewable energy sector uh, so there is still way to go not yet quite there but working hard <laughs> uh, we always uh, have a chance to select the best technology suitable for the for the uh, for that site uh, and then there was just was it today or yesterday now published the, the quarter three uh, result that now our portfolio has has been growing a lot and now it's uh, 32 gigawatts maybe as a big picture first that that there is definitely need need for the fossil free energy is is increasing so the whole society is, is uh, getting electrified uh, and especially industry there is a big chance for for industry to turn more electric and uh, either directly or then indirectly through the through the e-fuels like like mentioned earlier uh, in the presentations today uh, then as a on the oh, on the eu level it's really ambitious ambitious goals uh, also in the whole eu to 25 fold the existing uh, offshore fleet there is in order to, to reach the, the climate neutrality by by 2050 and what it means in terms of uh, investments it's 800 billion euros it's really huge and in finland we are even more ambitious with the, with the carbon neutrality targets so 2035 and i'm saying that we are not able to reach that without offshore wind Uh, then when we are having a closer look on the Baltic Sea, it's good, steady, strong winds there out, out uh, at the sea uh, compared to onshore wind. And also the scale is, is some, something quite different because we have bigger turbines and, and then also uh, we can have more of those. There is less restrictions uh, at the sea. And then Okay, there is Halla mentioned. That's one of the, our wind farms, but so is the line also alone is is producing one and a half times of of all kilowatt of one or two uh, units momentarily. So it's really massive. Uh, and then the location, we we see that there is a great chance then to to have energy produced close to the demand so meaning less transfer through the through the network and meaning also less electrical losses uh, and for example this green hydrogen production could be one of those demand uh, which would be then close to the uh, to the production and well, onshore wind is momentarily the, the cheapest way to produce electricity, but we are seeing that uh, through technological advance, advancement uh, and uh, it's also the offshore wind is, is getting competitive uh, by the end of the decade. And then also, also there is a chance to, to, to build the grid between the countries uh, so that not only to, to one country, but also to, to, to interconnect uh, between the European countries, so it's a good, good opportunity then. And then to transfer the electricity where the need is the most. Uh, power to X. There is definitely the certain times when there is a like a significant surplus of electricity, 
but like like mentioned in Shiva's presentation that it's not that often that then the then the like the production uh, capacity factor would be too low but as a as a result it could be still the good chance to to convert the the hydrogen into ammonia or synthetic fuels because that will then enable in a bigger scale uh, the turning into green green uh, fuels and like Joel Uwe also mentioned that that for example green methanol it's much more easy to store and transport uh, to the to the customer or where it's it's needed and and consumed hydrogen it's itself it's it's the, it's it's challenging <laughs> to store uh, then a few words about the biodiversity uh, it's really important for OX2 that we are taking seriously and, and looking always at ways ways to improve uh, the ecological conditions and the biodiversity where we are building our our wind farms and as a one of the side products in the hydrogen production with electrolysis there is oxygen produced like like shown in the presentation and it could be a good chance that if we have the production at the sea that then we will uh, push this this oxygen into the sea bottoms where it's a lack of oxygen so that could be really improving the, the Baltic Sea uh, natural status and, and improve then the and the biodiversity there. Here is about our offshore pipeline. Uh, the green ones are the Swedish projects, which are already a bit more advanced. Uh, and, and then in Finland, we have three, three bigger uh, sites, meaning Laine, close to close to Vaasan, Uusi Kaarilepy and Pietarsaari, and then Halla there in uh, close to Oulu and Hailuoto, and then Nuatun projects there around Oland uh, Islands. And as you can see, each of them is gigawatt scale. So we are really talking about the about the energy transition here. Then more detailed about line project. So it's located there west of Pietarsaari and Uuskarlepy, about about 30 kilometers from the coastline. So even though they they are big, massive wind turbines up to 370 meters high, they are well. When the weather is really good, then you can see them at at the, in the landscape, but uh, but uh, quite quite uh, small. Uh, even though it would be up to 150 turbines. And we are momentarily now doing this uh, environmental impact assessment. We just uh, on, on Tuesday afternoon had uh, the public event there in Pietarsaari. And there was lots of people interested in, in the project and, and hearing more about that. Uh, there is several grid connection opportunities, one of them being being there in, in Uusi Kaarlepy, for example, Kaanes, uh, Old Ore Harbor, and there is the Rock Havens, for example, creating a chance for, for the storage opportunities, or there in Pietarsaari, also in the harbor area. Uh, there is uh, also CO2 available for possible uh, uh, e-fuel production. And when we are talking about the, about the electricity production, it would be 11 terawatt hours per year. Uh, so, but it, it's not that like easy to understand. And then I was just calculating that how much it would be one rotation. So one spin, which are about, it takes about 12 seconds uh, when when all these 150 wind turbines would be doing this one one spin, it would produce uh, 7,500 kilowatt hours, which is the annual electricity co uh, consumption of of three households, meaning like a two-room 
uh, block house uh, households. So this gives a, a better understanding that how much of electricity we are talking about. And like in Chell Uber's map, it was shown really the biggest uh, spot at the line, line of wind farm. So there is a chance that that all this up to 2000 megawatts, which is the nominal capacity, would be then turned uh, into hydrogen. Or then there is also a chance to, that the part of the production we we produce and, and transfer as electricity and then part about uh, then as a, as a hydrogen, but it's not yet uh, decided. And of course, when we are talking about 11 terawatt hours, then it's one sixth of the electricity production of the whole Finland uh, momentarily. So this is well momentarily very, very hot topic, this energy independency. So this would really increase our energy independency also. Uh, okay, here's one one like a screenshot a screenshot taken from the environmental impact assessment uh, program um, re report, just showing more in detail that how it would look like. Uh, here the wind farms are at a plot <laughs> like a black black dots, and they seem to be close to each other, but in reality they are something like one and a half, two kilometers apart from each other in order that they don't take the, the wind from each other too much. And then there is the, the corridors for the cables and, and then also the hydrogen uh, pipeline options are the this VVE uh, marked uh, routes. Then briefly about the time schedule. So since these are massive projects and offshore, first of all, is is something new, especially in the in the icy conditions. Also, there is lots of things to be to be considered and, and taken into consideration in the design and, and the concept development, which we are now momentarily doing parallel uh, to the permitting and the, and the field studies. Uh, well, then we can see that then towards end of the decade, we can start the construction works and then the first kilowatt hours would be then just when reaching 2030. Or in when everything goes very smoothly, then it would be an opportunity to have uh, slightly earlier production started. But, uh, but this is now the base, base uh, time schedule. Then a bit more detailed about the hydrogen concepts. So there is ba basically three uh, ways. Uh, you can see that this this one is is illustrating uh, the concept that we produce electricity at the wind turbines and then also transfer the electricity to the shoreline. And then produce the hydrogen at the shoreline and then we have also the storage uh, location here. Then the middle one is here that we have the hydrogen production as a centralized unit at the sea. Uh, so electricity from the wind turbines connected to this and it would be then next to a substation also uh, the hydrogen unit and then we have a pipeline to bring the hydrogen uh, to, to the coast. Maybe something to mention that, that with the hydrogen, it's it's much less uh, losses uh, compared to the electrical losses, even though increasing the voltage level, still you are facing the electrical losses. The hydrogen pipeline would have this advantage to have less losses. Or then as a third option, then the hydrogen would be produced at each wind turbine, and then we would have only connections through the hydrogen pipeline to the coastline. Then, and then there is just few uh, photos and illustrations. So this is from Siemens Camesa, 
their idea how it could look like. So then it's basically containerized. We have both the purification there and then also the hydrogen productions uh, there. And then some storage, meaning as a storing the pure hydrogen, it would require a lot of this because the capacity is so high. Then as a second chance, it would be under high, high pressure. Uh, it would be then storing the hydrogen in liquid form. Or then if turning them into e-fuels, this is representing the, the methanol, uh, which can be then easily stored in the atmospheric uh, uh, pressure and temperature also in the liquid form. That's my presentation. Any questions then? OK, thank you very much, Oli. Very good, interesting presentation on very, about a very hot topic in many countries like UK, uh, Denmark, and also now at the moment here in Finland. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? There is at least one, uh, Frederick Hansten. Uh, if I, Emma, can you please open? So that the question is that, have you considered shipping routes when designing the large uh, line of uh, wind farms? So it's uh, about shipping routes. Yes, of course, like uh, shipping is, is something, especially wintertime shipping is something which, which, because then you just cannot choose any route, but you need to have the icebreakers there to assist uh, the vessels. Uh, in this area, there is no, no like official shipping routes, but they are just, uh, just going the shortest way. And we have been in a close cooperation with the, with the authorities responsible for shipping. And uh, they have stated that this this area is not, not not that problematic from the shipping perspective, even though the wind farm would be built there. Uh, I would personally have a question regarding the shipping. So, have you considered only the option also not only uh, to use pipelines from the offshore wind farm, but also that you might collect the produced hydrogen which ships from from there uh, within the wind farm if the distance from the shore is very let's say along there yes naturally that is a option also but now we have included the pipeline in there since it is a uh, we are in the environmental impact assessment phase and then it's better to include also the options it's easier than to drop out you cannot add later on but you can drop out uh, some some uh, parts which is then of course less impact for the environment mm -hmm. good thank you then there are two uh, questions if we take first the question from Mika Hakosala maybe uh, hi Mika uh, what about uh, the heat losses in electrolyzing phase so uh, do you have any plans or ideas because you don't have the same option like we do here onshore that we can, for example, utilize the loss heat uh, with the district heating system. So have you any talks about this, what, what Mika asked there? Uh, yes, that, that's a good point. On, of course, onshore it, it should be and would be then utilized, uh, for example, in the, in the, in the centralized uh, and distributed heat, heating system. Uh, but then offshore it is more problematic because the value of the heat is also also, also uh, low so it's it's more difficult to get that uh, utilized but of course we are considering the options but uh, no firm uh, plans yet one third question from frederick hansten still uh, about the real estate taxation or income. So who is uh, getting paid from these uh, offshore wind farms and wind turbines? Is it the state or municipality or somebody else? Uh, well, when we are there far out in the sea, in the economical zone, it's it's not uh, belonging to any municipality area. So the, then there is no similar kind of real estate tax, tax uh, applying to this. But then we are seeing that in, in generally very, very positive uh, for for the region and, and when this kind of uh, investment would be built there because it will then boost a lot of, like uh, Jell Uwe was also mentioning, the lots of those subcontracting opportunities and harbors are very uh, 
like a you know important role into offshore uh, wind farms. So then there would be lots of investments and also then the tax benefits directly to the municipality coming through that and then with, through the employment more people and, and paying the taxes through etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a, like a long value chain then. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think uh, we were visiting Scotland around about 10 years ago, and uh, let's say interesting piece of information was that in the United Kingdom, the seabed is owned by the uh, uh, court uh, as real estate company. So it's actually the royal family who gets all the uh, incomes from the uh, offshore wind turbines. And there might be a correlation that UK is the leading offshore <laughs> uh, country in, in the whole Europe. Uh, but let's move forward. Uh, yeah, two things th maybe still before we start with the next episode. Uh, first, uh, only we, like I mentioned you to you, I think last March here in Vasa. So we are doing another R and D project where we are studying, or Tony Lustila from my uh, University of Applied Science, uh, to uh, about this hydrogen topic with offshore wind farms. So we would be very keen on to collaborate with you. It's free of charge, labor for you. If there's just anything that we can help and assist you, hopefully. And the second thing is that please give my greetings, greetings to Tommy Loikkanen, uh, Loikkanen sorry, uh, very, very much from, from Basel. Good, thank you, Oli. A Excellent. great presentation. And, and let's move forward. And next we have Kaisa Pentila here in live. And Kaisa will be in charge of the next session, which is um, its panel discussion. And um, you will start with the video. So please go ahead. Yes, thanks so much, Rossi. So we will now um, continue with discussing um, the continuation of the networking activities around hydrogen here in, in the region of Ostrobotnia. But first up, we will have a video greeting from Mr. Matti Malkamäki and Ms. Minna Neesman, uh, who will have some greetings to the Ostrobotnian actors. Hello, hello Matti, hello Minna, welcome. I'm really happy that you could join me for a quick chat about the future and continuation of the hydrogen activities here in the Ostrobotnia region. Now, both of you have been key people and collaborators along this one year journey that we have had with our H2 ecosystem roadmap project. Um, could you just shortly tell the audience who you are and uh, what you are doing in the Finnish hydrogen scene at the moment? If we could start with Minna first, and then Matti. Thank you, Kaisa. It's a pleasure to be here, and it really was a pleasure to meet you as I came as a project manager to the National Hydrogen Network in about a year ago. And you were the person and your team and the H2 Ecosystem Roadmap was the project that very warmly welcomed us to Vasa the very same day I began. <laughs> so I, I'm really happy for this project, how, how it has worked from the very beginning to this moment. And I, I'm greeting you for all the work that you've been doing. So, so uh, much. shortly, I am coordinating the national network of uh, hydrogen actors in the public sector and also open it, opening it to the cooperation across borders, both to the west and to the south. Thanks. And Matti. Yeah, well, I'm uh, I'm a little bit like a check of all trades in, in, in the hydrogen scheme in that sense, so that I'm, uh, first of all, and most of all, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, so running two companies, uh, Aurelia Turpines and Heikamite, that are both uh, active players in the in the uh, hydrogen scheme. Um, but then on, on top of that one, um, I've not only been active uh, in the hydrogen uh, network, that means not just explained, but I'm, I'm also a steering group member of the Finnish uh, hydrogen cluster and then then also in this this new Bosnia uh, initiative between Finland and Sweden. Um, and, and, and on top of that one, like for example now here in Brussels, so that I'm, I'm active for the hydrogen in Europe and, and for the other uh, stakeholders here in, in, in the Brussels region or say Central European region. Um, but yeah, from, from my point of view, I mean this has also been a very, very uh, Good journey that what we've had. Uh, also remember the first day at Vasa, and when I met that, okay, wow, this is like a great, great, uh, so to say, organization and, and everything that how 
it was kicked off and what kind of meetings we had there. I mean, it was it was really cool. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for for those um, your short introductions and and uh, reflecting a little bit back on on the first first um, kickoff of of this project and and also the kickoff of the national hydrogen network. But so uh, now this project, uh, of course, obviously this is the final seminar. So this project has come to its end, but we can clearly see that the hydrogen activities here in our region are, are really just picking up speed. So um, as we are now at this junction or crossroad and uh, looking for ways to continue the work um, that has been done and, and also the networking activities here in our region, what would be your greetings to all of us, all the Ostrobotnian actors who want to be involved in developing the hydrogen economy here in our region? Matti, uh, could you start first? Oh, well, yeah, okay. Um, but um, I, I think that uh, it's it's about the same stuff that what we have, you know, generally uh, about the hydrogen, so how it is coming and so forth. So um, I would really put like five points in, in place here. So first of all, uh, the, the hydrogen is coming. That's for sure. So that there's no, no like a, like a, discussion about that one anymore that whether whether it really happens or or whether you know this is this is something that will not take place eventually and so forth so there's big enough so to say um forces behind the transi transition now so that we can we can say that it, it will take place the second thing is that uh it will take a lot longer than what we what we might think so that there are there are quite a few um uh players that are saying that okay the hydrogen ecosystem or hydrogen uh world will be there like in five years times or something no it will will take a lot longer so that is that is something that we need to also realize in the Ostrobotnia region uh thirdly we do need to have uh the understanding for the regulation so that there's quite a lot of uh, stuff happening on the regulation part uh still and, and that that actually comes all the way from from say in Europe from Brussels uh, level to to the uh, local players in in vast area for example and there there's there's a lot of stuff that we need to do and and this kind of work I I, I do um, foresee that that also you should uh, be able to to have a look um fourthly uh when we compare Finland's and especially the Ostrobotnian area to to quite a few other regions in in Europe um, we can say that there's a lot of potential and we have been working uh, within the Bothnia uh, project and, and also in the hydrogen cluster and so forth for getting these, you know, investors, these these parties from from central part of the Europe to, to recognize the, the areas we are now talking, the, the whole uh, Bothnian area and to understand that uh, this is this is something worth investing into. And this kind of actions, I, I, I do see that that they need a lot of uh, more work uh, on Ostropotnian area as well and in, in Vasa region, so to say. So so there's quite a quite a lot of, of uh, uh, stuff that we, we can actually do all you know together in, in that respect. And the last but definitely not least point is that if you think about the whole hydrogen value chain, so we are we are talking in the media usually about the, the power generation so that you can make uh, hydrogen from power and from hydrogen you can make power and so forth but but you have also these other hydrogen um, value chain parts like hydrogen being a feedstock for the for the industry or hydrogen being a feedstock for the for the fuels and then the fuels can be transferred to hydrogen again so so this all means that there's there's quite a lot of such things that we actually don't know yet that what mm. is going to happen here system integration you know, new kind, new kind of softwares, new kind of, you know, services are needed and so forth. And I see that, especially the Ostropothian area, and with a strong foothold that you have on the, on the IT companies and you know all the energy management systems and so forth, that can create a lot of jobs uh, for the area. So these are my five points, just quickly. So. Thank you. Thank you. Very kind of um, broad, uh, but. We will definitely pick up on those and uh, uh, maybe the things that I picked from is that both we need to have the eagerness to do things, but yes. also the patience to uh, work 
uh, with a long-term perspective. Correct. How about Minna? Would you like to continue? I'd like to open with a provocation and, and quote Obu Underettaser, leave a look out. Life is local. So whatever you do, just do it. <laughs> just don't stop <laughs> because you have a history of cooperating. And uh, two things I like very much about your cooperation is, it, is that it is uh, done uh, over the sector of public and private. Your companies and your governance are working greatly together and the, the campus area is just strengthening and giving a testbed for, for that all. And the other one, one is the natural connections to over the bay to the Swedish side. You get a lot of examples, a lot of good benchmarks there that you can uh, then translate if needed to the rest of the country and show in your pilots. So that thir my third po point would be be as tangible as you have been. You have already moved from plans to pilots and such, and it's uh, to be expected that uh, the area really is growing to a hydrogen valley of some kind. Mm. Uh, and uh, whatever the uh, solutions are, if they are projects or if there are any ombudsmen or whatever you choose to do uh, to guarantee that there is continuity. So I see Vasa area as, as really one of the a few hotspots that that really are uh, developing to a hydrogen valley. So I, I'm very confident with the fact that you will be, you have good people there working for courses that it will continue. And I wish you the best of luck. May Thank I, you. May I have something here? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Matti. Because uh, there was there was one event uh, during this one year that we have now been working together mm. that especially you know warms my heart deeply. <laughs> Uh, and that is that is the fact that um, how the organization from the Honingen people from from the Netherlands was organized mm. in Vasa. And uh, already in the springtime, it was a great success. I mean, everybody was like in favor that, okay, this is exactly like the hot warmness and the, the hostessness that what we, well, what you actually did uh, there as a project manager and, and so forth. So so this was this was something very, very, very professional. And uh, I happened to be uh, in, in the Netherlands, in the Groningen, in the Winnemitzkas uh, seminar, was it three, four weeks ago? Uh, I, gave a, I gave a presentation there about the, the uh, Bosnia area and, and you know, everything that happened there. And the people that visited Vasa and so forth, all the warm words that they had still after like six months later and something like that, and how they saw that, okay, this, this kind of cooperation we need to have, and we need to start building on those relationships that we created there and so forth. It mm -hmm. was really, really, really um, genuine. And, and, you know, really, I mean, you, you, you don't make these kind of things out of, you know, just yeah. joy or something like that. But yeah. it, was, it was really, really good. And it Thank was you. really professional. And I'm, I'm, I'm so proud on everything that what happened there. So. Uh I'm so to, happy to, be, to hear. <laughs> to the audience, a bit of info. Matti is talking about a society that has got rid of natural gas and is replacing it with renewable and other clean uh, energy infrastructure. And if they are uh, keeping Vasa as an example or something mm -hmm. to look up to, you really should be proud. So mm -hmm. congratulations, right. Kaisa, and all the Thank, others. Thanks so much. And I, I wish to um, point out that this was a collaboration with Merinova, uh, Trino Varblane from Merinova, and also from uh, Vasek. Many uh, people from Vasek were, were involved in arranging this. So a big thanks to the whole team. Uh, but I really wish to thank you for all the support uh, we have gotten uh, during this project and, and for your words. Um, uh, it makes me very proud and, and of course proud of our region as well. And I think that we should continue to um, work on our strengths and build on those because we really we really are a region where these types of collaborations are possible and, and where we get um, the value that is created through these collaborations is so much more than, than just the sum of the pieces altogether. So, but a big thank you to 
the both both of you and and uh, let's uh, continue with our good collaboration also in the future. Let's do so. Thank you. Looking forward to the future. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Okay, so picking up from where we left off with Minna and Matti, and as you could see, I'm able to duplicate myself and travel in space and time, but yes, so continuing. Um, now we will, as Minna said in the video, all activities are really done locally. And although we already, uh, during this project, made the connection both to the national level and the international level uh, with our um, connections to, to, for example, Holland and, and the Groningen region. All the development work that really needs to be done here in the region is done locally and, and very much by the actors who are present here. So uh, I hope that I will have uh, with me now online uh, regional mayor of the Council of Ostrobotnia, uh, Mats Brandt. Are you able to uh, put up your video and sound. Then I hope I also have with me Lasse Pohjola from Vasek. Hello Lasse, hello Mats. And Tauna Kekale from Merinova. Are you also online and, and able to join us for, for a short discussion on, on the activities and, and their continuation here? Yes, we I get the, the microphone works but the video doesn't want to so okay that's fine we have you we have you here online as well i'm really happy that that you're with me um so your organizations are all really key actors for this regional development here in our region um and as our project result and and really the key message that we want to send out is that hydrogen will play a major role in the development and in Ostrobotnia, and we need to continue with, with these uh, collaboration and networking activities. And I would like to ask you now from your organization points of view, um, what are the activities uh, that can support uh, the development of the hydrogen economy now? And, and how, how should we continue? How are you going to continue with, with developing the region? So. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, if I may uh, ask Mats to begin, uh, how do you see from uh, the regional strate strategy work point of view uh, this supporting the development of the hydrogen economy? Well, thank you, Kaisa. Do you all hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so, first of all, uh, big thanks for a very interesting seminar so uh, i've enjoyed the presentations and it's been really informative and uh, above all um, really topical issues and i'm really thankful that you uh, arranged this seminar and thanks for allowing me to say a few words here um, well most of you will be uh, acquainted with what the regional council does but just briefly uh, to say a few words you know our main business is long-term planning so we do regional development strategies and um, in particular with regard to today's topic i would like to um, to to mention our regional land use plan which is one of the essential frameworks when we want to talk about um, um, the energy transition and, and promoting a carbon neutral, even, even carbon negative society. So uh, uh, you can see this quite uh, clearly in our regional development strategies and we have um, development objects going long forward into the future uh, up to 2050 talking about Ostrobotnia being a carbon negative society. And of course, if that's the long long-term goal we also have to talk about mid-term goals and short-term goals and um, in that regard uh, we, we are quite committed to this transition um, maybe just 
um, briefly to mention where we are with the regional land use plan and uh, to get you to, to have a firmer grasp of what I'm talking about. I'll just show you uh, this one map. Um, I'll skip forward to this part. Can you see this? Yes. So this is uh, maybe from my point of view, the most instru instrumental uh, plan that we have uh, when it comes to uh, promoting renewables and uh, everything uh, around it. Um, which concerns innov innovations, energy technology, energy systems. And um, our current regional land use plan um, uh, enables uh, the land use for, for example, wind farms. So that's why this is quite instrumental. And, and at the moment, we are at the third place among regions when it comes to installed uh, wind capacity. But as you have seen here today, uh, a lot is happening. Uh, in a few years, we're going to have 10 times as much installed wind capacity here. And in, in particular, if we can implement the offshore wind farms, then it's going to be a whole new game in a few years time. So uh, a lot is happening. I'm very thankful for the presentations from so uh, varied <laughs> actors in, in, in this game, on, on this field today with us uh, at this seminar. Um, just briefly, uh, one new addition to our regional land use plan, which we are currently talking about uh, actually this week, and that's um, about the national gas grid and how will it be implemented in Ostrobotnia. So uh, we're, from our uh, perspective, prepared to acknowledge this uh, gas line connection in the regional land use plan 2050, which is going to be prepared next year and decided upon 24. So this is, in that sense, a really topical issue that we're talking about this week. Thank you. Thanks so much, Max. Yes, um, a lot of different activities going on uh, at your end as well and, and in the regional development. Um, uh, this was maybe um, a lot uh, on the higher strategy level, but I would now like to hear also from Lasse Pohjola uh, at VASEC and then Tauno Kekale from Merinova. You are working with regional development really on the on the grass, grassroots level with, with different projects uh, where actors collaborate together. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about what is going on right now and what are you planning for the future? Um, Lasse, please, could you start? Yes, thank you, Kaisa. So uh, shortly, uh, the energy transition in maritime uh, will be a national part of our daily work in the uh, nearest uh, future. Uh, future maritime energy solutions are practically all based on hydrogen, is it methanol or ammonia? And uh, a major part of our work here at WASEC uh, is to uh, build the networks and in, in our case in uh, Nordic countries. And uh, at WASEC in our focus are other local companies in, in Ostrobotnia. And there is a definitely a need for networks uh, uh, to find the right contact for our small and medium sized companies uh, to generate uh, new business. And uh, we are definitely in time uh, to do that work because we have heard now uh, that how long is it take, but uh, it will be very comprehensive change uh, what will happen, what would we, we have the time and now it's uh, now it's really time to to start to work and build the network to find your place and uh, i think uh, we have all the technology already so we are ready ca very capable uh, to act in in global markets so that's what we are doing today thank you thank you lasse tauno would you like to continue from that yeah, we have uh, at Merinova both uh, kind of responsibility of taking care of the ecosystem agreement with the city of Vasa, together with the state of Finland, and also we are quite a lot working with the with the smart specialization strategy of Ostrobotnia region. These are maybe the two guidelines that we are working with, and both have in 
in very kind of central role at the moment, the energy storage, the green transition that then leads to more flexible, uh, greener energy production formats. And that, of course, ultimately leads to, leads to storage questions. We work a lot with the battery industry area there at the, behind the, the airport of Vasa. But we also think that it would be a good, very good time to to have this hydrogen as some kind of a topical element in in the programs and the strategies that we have forward, because it will, together with the wind farms, especially the offshore wind farms, will be a very central central element of the energy solutions of Ostrobotnia for the next fifty years. Yes, uh, referring to the to the battery cluster, the Gigavasa project, I think, has been very, very successful and, and very visible also uh, of raising up the level uh, of uh, that the area is is um, is investing in this, is, is building the ne network and the support structures for this type of industry. And if we could get a similar type of organization uh, behind Hydrogen, I think that would be that would be a good yeah, thing. That's precisely what I mean. Of course, the batteries are also uh, different types of storage compared to heat storage or hydrogen or gases. They are very short term. They could be used for an electric car, for example, for three, four, five years, uh, five days, sorry, and then then uh, just to uh, level the, the changes in in the production, for example, over some seconds or some minutes batteries and capacitors could be good, but we need to also have energy that we can store and transport, store and then take back into use one year from now that doesn't disappear anywhere. And hydrogen is is with different other gases, maybe the only solution for that kind of, of use in the longer run. Um, looking at now uh, the continuation of activities, of course, one crucial part, one key building block for that is financing. Without that, nothing can happen without resources and financing for this type of work. Uh, we, we won't have these activities. How do you, what type of uh, funding possibilities do you see? And uh, can you recommend actors to, to be now active in seeking? Uh, would any one of you like to <coughs> take the question it's always this is the most difficult one <laughs> much <Mats, laughs> yeah, you you. take that yeah thanks guys and um, of course uh, i'm committed to having these kinds of networks continuing really i mean it's really important for us to to maintain this pole position that we have so uh, I, i'm i on my behalf am am really uh, at your disposal to to try to uh, ensure that we can continue this development work network and um, maybe when it comes to funding um i, I would like to uh, talk a little about the national level um i would like to say to all of you guys who are listening here that i i'm really it, it, it's a nice time to be a regional mayor when you look at these application lists uh, for example, example for the uh, recovery and resilience uh, facility or to these uh, demonstration pilot projects that uh, the ministry have and Business Finland have been advancing. So um, Finland, uh, Ostrobotnia is in the fourth place when it comes to the recovery and resilience facility when it getting uh, applications approved. And uh, if you take a look at the list to the ministry, uh, of all the uh, demonstration applications made in September. Uh, the, the total sum applied for was uh, half a billion euros. And 15% uh, came from Ostrobotnia. So 85 uh, applications worth, worth 85 million came from our region. So I think something's been done right here and it's all thanks to you uh, in this network here. Thank you, thank you. Um, how, in our project, one of the recommendations that we are making is that this type of a hydrogen Ostrobotnia network or team would be started. Uh, if, we, if I pose the question to Lasse, you, <laughs> and also Tauno, what type of a role do you see that your organizations could take in establishing this? 
example, if, if I, I start, uh, I'm always lo looking at these things from uh, a Nordic per perspective. Uh, that means that uh, uh, I'm always talking about cooperation, uh, and, uh, especially in, in, in Nordics. And there are good examples that we have several projects uh, where all Nordic countries are cooperative because uh, we have uh, the same goal. And uh, so far, uh, NSVAS has been asked to join. And, and I feel that if we build this uh, hydrogen or Strabotnia, we will get more and more invitations to cooperate. And uh, if we have a, a good Nordic team, uh, uh, we will receive the funding as well. So we will we have to build the networks, the platforms, and uh, the financing will be available. I would pick up, Lasse, from what you said, really this word team, because it is really about, as Matti said also in his greetings, this is a people's business. So let's get together the team who can really drive this network forward. And, and I, I'm sure it will be possible. But Tauno, would you like to continue? Yeah, the task of Merinova from the beginning has been to work with the technologies. And hydrogen is, is clearly one of the really most important technologies for the green transition for the region for the world maybe and uh, it's one that we have not been that eager yet so we would have to as i said to get it some kind of more programmatic and that kind of programs with the with the ecosystem agreement between the state and and Vasa city they typically would fall to either Vasek or Merino, or of a combination of Vasek and Merino, to to start new programs in in that that scheme. So we, we are probably doing something like that to at least guarantee the the management of the network to continue. But we also all the time applying and helping people to apply projects that have to do with with hydrogen, other other forms of modern energy production and storage. So I'm sure we are going to have quite a lot of different fundings. Then the different thing is who has the possibility to work in those projects because we need to have different skills for different kind of projects. It's not always always Hanken. It's not always uh, maybe maybe also the University of Vasa. And it very seldom is Merinova because we are just coordinators. We are not hydrogen specialists ourselves. So this kind of uh, spider in a net kind of role is typical for Merinova. And we will continue with that and strengthen it towards the hydrogen economy. Thank you. Thank you. So building this team of, of different skills, different backgrounds, uh, but Merinova is very strongly willing to at least maybe take the take the coordinating role a little bit. Did I can I make this conclusion? Yeah, my boss said that everybody can phone me if they cannot catch you anymore. <laughs> Great. This is this is what I want to hear, and and I'm very happy to end this uh, panel discussion or, or our discussion here on this note. And and as you heard, there are the needed actors that will will drive this network forward. Although our project will end. Um, but thanks for my part. Thank you, Mats. Thank you, Lasse, and thank you, Tauno. Uh, I will now hand over to Ossian for the final words. Okay, thank you, thank Kaiser. you Kaiser, very much. Uh, good this panel discussion. A uh, few thoughts uh, regarding hydrogen economy and the future. One main driver for the hydrogen economy can be the grid connection issue with the wind farms. Because like Petri Parvianen from Finngrid said around about one week ago in, in television news, so the West Coast uh, starts to be fully deployed with wind farms pretty soon, and they cannot connect any more new fin wind farms here in Ostrobotnia in the near future. So hydrogen can definitely uh, offer one very good solution for this. Another driver that uh, also can boost the hydrogen econ economy very heavily is that uh, due to the Ukrainian war and, and, and uh, situation and market prices with methane, 
uh, it can be also, let's say, a great booster to produce, like many of you mentioned uh, in your presentations, uh, different kind of power to X solutions that we can produce uh, synthetic gases, may, mainly methanol, um, and, and replace the uh, natural gas by that. Um, my view case is, or I'm quite amazed that if we don't see quite much hydrogen production in our region within a time of 10 years. And it's very crucial that we start with the hydrogen production, because if we have the production capacity of clean hydrogen here in the region, we need also technology for that. And when we need the technology, we can apply, let's say, uh, the solutions that Wärtsilä, Danfoss, ABP, Hitachi Energy is, is providing us. And if these enterprises get, let's say, good experience track record on the uh, domestic market, it's much easier to, for them to start the exports. I, I was very pleased to hear that, that Merinova can take this uh, active role because uh, this has been a great journey for all three universities doing this project. Hanken, Vasi University of Applied Sciences and Novia University of Applied Sciences as well. Uh, one glad news, practical uh, let's say outcome of this project, uh, this is not any official information yet, but it's true, uh, is that uh, uh, we gained an uh, a uni an education program here to Vasa with hydrogen economy just two weeks ago, uh, and it's worth of uh, over half a million euros. And this would not have been possible without this project. Okay, we are running a little bit uh, out of time now. Uh, I'm very grateful for this occasion, and I would like to point out my deepest thank you for Ostrobotnian Council financing this project and European Union. Uh, and also we have had a steering group with this project and the steering group and industrial representatives have been very, very active uh, within this project as well. Then I want to uh, uh, point out a special thank you to Vasek. And especially we have had today Christopher Jansson, who has been behind the camera. Thank you, Christopher. And Emma Boos, another technical uh, um, uh, person there in the, in the background. So uh, I want to still say, Kaisa pointed out that, uh, that all the material will be available on the web page of our project, uh, h2ecosystems.org. Yeah? And, and you can find all the reports there. Uh, I think this is the seventh project where I've been involved, R&D pro project, and I think that we, we did the record in terms of material, two, three hundred pages of hydrogen writing, so that's quite much. Good, but thank you for the audience for participating for this um, end seminaria of our project. I'm very pleased that we were quite many, 55 persons at most here. So thank you for all of you and see you. Thank you. Bye-bye.